We'll serve in East. Welcome to the Economic Development Committee meeting, 18th of May 2021, which is fair open. And we get an apology from Francois and an apology for lateness from Councillor Cogan. Are there any other apologies? So I'd like to move that they be accepted. Yeah. Councillor Davidson. Okay. Those in favour? Aye. Move on to the uh, Declaration of Interest document. It's on team systems, but it's also here. So if there's anything that's coming up that you feel you have an interest that you should uh, declare, please do. Item three is urgent items not on the agenda. Um, I haven't been advised of any. Um, move on. Item four is the minutes of the previous meeting. And the previous meeting was on the 16th of February, 2021. The minutes have been circulated. We haven't had any requests for changes, but are there any requests? Thank you, and someone like to move with the minutes of the Economic Development Committee meeting held on the 16th of February, 2021, be confirmed as true and correct record of the meeting. Councillor Hart, I'm seeing that. Peter, thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Uh, I approve that my digital signature will be added to the confirmed Economic Development Committee meeting minutes of the 16th of February 2021. Move on to item five on the agenda, which is the action list. And it's on pages five to six of your agenda. And Chief Executive. Yeah, good afternoon, Your Worship and Councillors. Uh, and other committee members. I'll take you through the action list one by one. I'll take questions at the end. Uh, the first action, Development West Coast. Um, this was to do with uh, Mayor and the CE uh, working with CEM to look at um, leveraging uh, improving resilience to the region. So I can advise that the CEM group would be successful in receiving a $90,000 grant for a role to um, progress business case development for critical infrastructure needs, uh, working closely with Lifelines and various other key stakeholders of the West Coast to put a package together. So that we are business ready for when the opportunity for funding comes along. This will also help us identify if council needs to invest in certain aspects of their infrastructure to improve resilience as well. Uh, the second point, Hakutika Airport site visit. Uh, obviously, the body works have started on the extension of the terminal. What I propose is that uh, future state we will get a uh, a visit to, to to the airport extension or to the upgrades. And also, I suggest we talk about potential the EOC locations on the same visit and um, do that once we have some a roof over the, over the new extension. Uh, PG and shovel ready projects, uh, basically an update each meeting. So this is actually an ongoing process with Warren Gilbert and Mimbi being represented in this forum and future forums. Meter of support for Alan Giles, Wrestling Car Club, so that has been completed. Uh, Franz Joseph and Fox Classy Destination Management Plan. So obviously the Dome West Coast is taking a lead on developing this as an overall package of work. And that is ongoing. I'm not sure of the current status. Uh, An email will give me the full list of PGF projects with current status supplied as part of the reference material um, as part of this in teams. And the last point of being strategy. Um, Destination Western takes the lead on regards to events on behalf of council. This doesn't mean that we can't co jointly um, develop a strategy. Uh, but I suggest that DW takes the lead in developing the strategy, which we can endorse and support. Probably uh, ask Joe to look at taking that back to Destination Westland. If you take any questions, to worship. I believe so. We'll go around the table. Councillor Davis. Uh, thanks, Simon. No, 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 no questions on that. Mm, sure. And just with the event strategy, there will be a West Coast regional event strategy that will be 
sent out to the stakeholders that we had for the second time, I think. Down here a while back, you would have met with quite a few people, including Destination Westland. That um, strategy will be released shortly. Okay, so it may be a drill down just for the it's a, Yeah, area. so it'll be a drill down from that. So that should be released, as I say, for publication and wider viewing in a few weeks. Great. Uh, Joanne? No, nothing for me, thank you, Your Worship. Brilliant. Nothing for me. Councillor Hart? Nothing for me, thanks. Uh, we have some requirements or some, some actions for our day now. We received an email from Captain Margaret and we were able to make sure lighting is upgraded and maintained to a high standard. So we're working through those requirements at the moment. Councillor Martin, do you feel comfortable in disclosing your red on that? Yes, yes, no, I did request it to be part of the discussion today, an agenda item. So if we can, I'd like it. Raised as, an, in, as a general business agenda item to talk about the Puanga Matariki oh. Festival. That's right. It was, uh, it was after the agenda was circulated, so fortunately it couldn't make it on the agenda formal. But so we don't have any formal response in terms of our original letter. So um, we can reach out to them exactly. So, so the target, I think, is January next year to have that circuit identified and um, I suppose a business case developed. So that's their call to do that, but we haven't been back from them yet. I have, uh, I have had a discussion with Alan and Giles and, and they're just putting the final parts of together now. So it's looking positive. Yeah, that'll be a bit too long there. Yeah, so it's calendar. There'll be an application that we need to come for road management and all sorts of other aspects which we need to understand rather than the answer. Any other matters on the moment? Okay, well, uh, we'd certainly like to move the action, the updated action was received and that the Hogan uh, degree site visit be removed and the letter of support to Alan Giles be removed and the event strategy be removed to the destination. Are you comfortable with that, uh, councillors? Mm -hmm. So, we can have a look at And we'll have a movement. I'd like to, to move that the action, day, action, the updated action must be received with those uh, removed. Yep. Councillor Davidson, Councillor Martin, those in favour? Thank you. Next item on the agenda, and uh, we'll uh, welcome uh, Peter Armstrong. Peter, uh, thanks for taking the time to come along. Peter's going to give us an update on West Powers projects and their uh, importance. Your Worship, uh, Councillors uh, Rangatira Opitini Notahu uh, Tina Kota, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, uh, I have to confess, it's about a year ago, I think, that I met with the uh, Chief Executive Simon Bastian and we first, he first invited me to join you to, to talk about uh, West Power and Electric Group. So, sorry, it's taken me a little uh, while to get there. Um, so I started as Chief Executive uh, just over one year ago, um, and uh, today I'm quite keen to just talk a little bit about um, the group, the company, uh, what we do from the economic development perspective. I suspect that you already know a reasonable a bit about us, um, but what I increasingly am finding is that um, that uh, we have we could be doing a better job of telling our stories. So part of today is to do that. Um, Thank you. 
I recently presented um, at a strategic summit and pushed it took a many times only for it to catch up and take me about five or six slides into the presentation. So but once once bitten. <laughs> Oh, okay. thank you, thank you, thank you very much, there, Um So, uh, the, the Internet Group consists of five um, operating companies owned by West Power, which is uh, in trust and uh, wholly owned uh, by uh, the West, West Power. Sorry, the West Coast uh, Electric Power Trust. So, in other words, that's the consumers of the West Coast that own the company. And our purpose as a company is, is to um, provide sustainable electrical solutions, which enhance our community. This means, as a business, we're a long term player uh, with a long-term view on investment and sustainability uh, of our supply of electricity on the West Coast. Um, our vision is to be leaders in electrical energy and technology, and I'm, I plan to talk a little bit more about that um, uh, later in my presentation. But it's just worth um, reminding um, that everybody that every dollar of profit that the West Power Electric Group makes uh, goes back into our community, which I personally think is a really cool story. Okay. Yeah, we're away. Cool. So um, I won't go too deeply into the history of electricity industry reform, um, much at all as I know that, that we would all find that extremely interesting. Um, but back in, uh, basically, the, the formation of West Power Electricity is a product of, um, of reform uh, in the 1990s, uh, leading to West Power Electricity being incorporated as trust owned in the late, uh, late 90s. So West Power itself, uh, the obvious thing about us on the West Coast is that we own the distribution assets. So uh, well, the electricity system is split up into generation, transmission, distribution, retail, distribution of the poles and wires and substations and infrastructure you see on the coast for the most part. So that's what West Power owns. Um, but obviously we're much, we're much more as a company than that now. So um, I'll sort of move into the growth story. And if you look at this um, curve beginning in the uh, year 2000, this is actually a head count. Um, revenue and profitability show similar sorts of profiles. And you can see over the last 20 years, we've grown from about 50, 40, 50 people to, uh, to over 330 now. Um, so, uh, and those 330 people were not necessarily all employed on the coast, about 180 here on the coast, but um, all around New Zealand. So that's a pretty cool story. Um, there's five operating companies uh, in the Electronet Group. Amethyst Hydro, just working my way left to right across the, the, uh, the slide here, Amethyst Hydro, um, fantastic award-winning 7.5 megawatt run of river uh, hydro asset um, down there, Harry Harry. Now, this um, was built and commissioned in the early 2000s, and, uh, and it's something that we're immensely proud of. And just to kind of put it into perspective from an economic development and resilience perspective, uh, back in, I think when it was Cyclone, um, Cyclone's Gita and possibly Fate as well, a few years ago, uh, we lost connectivity with TransPower, the, the, uh, the transmission operator. So uh, that put us in a position where the power was effectively unable to be restored. Now, the cool thing about uh, Amethyst was that we were able to get Hogan Ticker online and run in what they call an islanded uh, mode based on having that hydro asset on our doorstep. There's other hydro assets around as well. Um, but look, we think that's really cool. And um, I think um, as, as you'll see as I get to the end of my presentation, you know, this type of thing, uh, from a resilience on the coast perspective, we think is just so, so important. Uh, just in the middle of the electricity contracting, so uh, that's actually our largest business now, employing around 200 of our people um, and located throughout New Zealand, Taranaki, uh, Nelson, uh, on the coast, obviously, but also down in Cromwell. Um, and that's all parts of the electrical sector from low voltage, you know, plugs on the wall, light volts through to medium voltage through to high voltage, 230,000 uh, volt uh, electric transfer. So it's pretty serious stuff. Uh, moving along, West Power, I've mentioned that is the mothership. The, the asset owning part of the business has about 200 million of assets on the balance sheet, um, uh, predominantly the, the poles and wires and substation asset transformers, etc., here on the coast. Um, Mitten Electronic, um, engineering design business, quite um, in the late 2000s, um, quite when it was about 14 or 15 people, we were to nearly 100. It's actually something about 19 now. COVID has just uh, reduced the numbers a little bit. But that's professional engineers um, selling their services throughout New Zealand, Australia, and also internationally. Uh, and finally, Electric Technology, that's the latest company we've incorporated and it's effectively our um, operating company for um, a, a highly innovative patent pending technology called PowerPilot. 
And so um, I won't go into too much detail, but effectively one of the challenges in um, distribution is understanding what's happening down at the low voltage. You think about in terms of pipes, as the pipes get smaller and smaller, it becomes increasingly difficult to know what's going on. The future of distribution networks relies on having technology that enables that. We've invented some of its world first. Uh, we're getting nominated for, for awards at the moment for it. So that's pretty exciting. So that's literally technology. One of the, um, the main things that I've been focused over the last uh, 12 months is uh, getting getting uh, my A team together. Um, we've got a little bit of change in our executive management team. So, uh, there we all are now, uh, seven of us, um, five based here on the coast, two based on Christchurch, one of them is myself. Um, on the far left, we have Simon Harvey. He started uh, with West Paris now nutrition. And after about 15 years, he's worked his way up and become general manager, manager of contractor. It's a fantastic story to be able to kind of uh, bring somebody in at the ground floor, uh, grow them, uh, provide them with leadership development, et cetera, keep them that they're operating nationally as an executive leader. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Brad Rooney, based in Christchurch, running with the electricity. Roger Griffith's been in the company 38 years. He's widely regarded um, across New Zealand and Australia as a, uh, if I can say it, a Jedi when it comes to all matters of electrical power. He really is deeply respected, so we're very lucky to have him. South in the middle. Robin Scott's just taken up a new executive role, general manager, uh, corporate services, people in safety. So that's a role that we didn't have previously, and that takes care of some, I guess, some, uh, um, some accountability around some of those key issues for our business. Um, so we've got Gene Bellock in the back there, uh, IT, and then Stu McQuist coming as our new role as CFO. Uh, so Stu's ex part of the now, so he's in the back. So that's our executive team. It's great to have that team um, operating, uh, working well at the moment. Well, cool, so this is where we are. Hopefully you can see that slide. And I sort of mentioned that um, you know, we started on the coast. Um, we've, we've spread our geographic footprint around New Zealand now. Um, the hotspots are the coast, Nelson and Christchurch, but we have a rapidly growing um, labour force in Wellington, Cromwell, and New Plymouth, and, and increasingly in Auckland as well. You know, it's 2021, so in theory we don't have to be in our locations to do our work, depending on the work type. Um, but we're finding uh, increasingly do with some clients. So we opened our Auckland office about three or four years ago so that we could be close to customers like Big Power and those types of um, entities. So that's pretty cool. And that's who we're working for. Um, the interesting thing though is if you actually look at this is just the last couple of years of projects. Um, there's a lot of information on that slide, but it just goes, if you looked at that alone, you wouldn't necessarily know where we were. And just goes to show it doesn't matter. The fact that we have 180 people here on the coast, um, we will, they are working all over New Zealand um, and contributing, as you'll see shortly, I hope, to some uh, projects of um, national significance. So that's all pretty cool. Um, so, just in summary, about 330 people and growing. Uh, we're about a $100 million business by the time you allow for uh, the, uh, the relative. Uh, transfers that we need to make for transfer pricing within our business, etc. 200 on the balance sheet, and um, owned by about 13,600 consumers actually on the West Coast. So that's that's pretty cool. And um, we pay it every year if we can, and we have been able to uh, mostly we pay a special discount to this because last year it was five million. We bought that forward from Christmas, which is when we normally do it. Obviously, COVID 19 year 2020, um, we were thinking of ways to, to do what we could, and uh, obviously, we're proud of owned by customers. Um, and the network itself, apologies for the map on the left, you won't be able to see that, but just really showing the extent of the network we, um, we own and operate from Reefton down to Fox um, and some statistics about the network itself. 50 gigawatt hours of electricity coming from that kind of and Just on the right hand side, you can see Amethyst, that's the wear and tax structure on the Amethyst River, and some guys uh, there just got uh, working on the top. All right, so I'm going to go through a few key projects that we're working on around New Zealand. Then I'm going to talk about some challenges and opportunities, and I should be done after about another uh, five to eight minutes. Um, and uh, I'll be really keen to hear your questions. So, uh, just on the left there, this is the, what the, the crews around the West Coast will be doing on a day to day basis. It could be um, uh, you know, replacing a pole, it could be dealing with fault. Um, could be a range of things. So, you know, when you're out in the barrier on the coast, chances are they're working on the West Coast network. Um, and uh, in this case, we're in um, a Nahiri and uh, replacing a wooden pole to a concrete pole. Concrete pole. So that's cool, that's related to our network. On the right hand side, um, I took these photos the other day in the basement of the old uh, Greymouth Hospital. Uh, now, uh, Electronet was subcontracted to Fletcher's to do all of the electrical work for the build of the new hospital. 
which we completed, um, and uh, it's all been commissioned. Um, we're just doing the final work now to to help with the uh, removal of the, the old hospitals. So uh, that's an example of one of the types of projects. Now, um, many of you will have heard or seen in the news the, um, the various discussions about T1.0 aluminium smelter. And my um, uh, career in the electricity industry, that's always been a question mark. What will happen every few years? Um, there is debate about whether it will, it will um, stay or it will go. And you might recall late last year, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion in the media about the potential living price. The time the aluminium price was about $1,500 a tonne. Um, so uh, Transpower made the decision uh, to upgrade the line um, from Clutha, Clutha up the Waitaki scheme. So um, that's really a project of national significance, which would be part of enabling the transfer of energy from south to north if it was needed to do so. So Electronics involved with that, um, and a very own Lucy Lane, who I'll talk about in a minute, it's one of the line mechanics down there doing that work. So a major, major bit of infrastructure project that our, our crews are cycling back and forth down to do. In the South uh, Taranaki now, this, um, this wind farm is just to the uh, west of Waverley, um, and for the Waitapi wind farm. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, in New Zealand. Um, and so Electronet was uh, contracted by the owner Tilt uh, Renewables to build the line from the substation Waverley to the site, but also all of the electrical reticulation around the site. Uh, so a major contract and a really um, strong relationship with our customer and Tilt. Yes. Um, Successfully commissioned, commissioned, I think, yeah, time last year, not quite long, but um, mid to late last year. So, if you were down in South Westland uh, uh, at the moment, there's a good chance you'll see one of our crews um, uh, in the deep south. So, we've been working for uh, the course for about 10 years, doing a range of work in the fibre space, and the latest project is to connect fibre from Fox down to Haas. So, we've had crews down there um, working on that project in a, um, a significant project that's ongoing. I think they're scheduled to finish something later in the year, a few months from now. And the final project I wanted to just talk about, and this, this is just shows a couple of our, um, our, our guys up at Pole installing this power pilot device. So I mentioned it briefly before. Uh, we've been very fortunate to be recognised by being nominated for a couple of awards um, and uh, very excited about it. So this is in, in uh, Grand Hill Summit. So earlier I mentioned that our vision is to be leaders in electrical energy and technology. And um, I think part of that is driven by our, I guess our belief around the ability to punch above our weight. So um, we've come off two industry awards so far this year. The first one, the Star Awards, where Lucy Bain um, took out the Future of Safety Award. Um, yeah, but she, Lucy's a, a trainee line mechanic. So I'm immensely proud to see her up in the lights um, uh, waving the company flag. Uh, we've recently returned back from Wellington where we were finalists for innovation and energy. Um, unfortunately, didn't get the uh, goal in that time, but um, you know we take a lot of comfort in the fact that you know we're a hundred million dollar company, we're up against billion dollar companies, um, and we're punching at that level. And we're just going to keep going back. Um, and then the next one that's coming up in a few weeks, we're going to be up to the safeguard. So this is actually outside of the electricity industry now, and, and um, all of the, the New Zealand health and safety. Uh, so we're up against um, a range of different industries this time. So very excited again to be put up. Ran for our, our innovation, use of innovation to increase safety outcomes. So, pretty cool. A couple more slides on outlook and opportunities. So, I think um, the, the interesting thing, if we look at um, the last two decades of electricity demand, which is if you look on the left hand side, the grey part of the graph uh, from 2020 backwards, electricity demand has been pretty flat, generally, you know, gradually increasing. Um, I think uh, the, the exciting opportunity for us as a heavily industry focused group of companies is the next uh, two to three decades look like substantial growth driven by electrification. So whichever way you cut the, um, you know, the macroeconomic signals, basically the future um, involves electricity. And so this figure is taken from, this figure has been repeated uh, a lot recently in our industry, but it's been taken from uh, Transpower's uh, Whakamana Iti Māori Hiko, which means empowering our energy future. And um, you can see there's, there's a reasonable amount of base growth there, but a significant amount come from process 
electrification as well as transport. So we see that as a, uh, as a um, massive opportunity. Uh, on the right hand side is a group, there's a figure just showing uh, some work that we've had done to look, not, not West Power, but West Power is part of a group of distribution companies to look at the, um, the, the, uh, the, the number of, I think the boiler loads over half a megawatt that could be electrified. Many of them might be, of course, um, or the other, other channels potentially, but um, if you add those up, they equate to just looking at the big stuff only about 20% of the overall system size. In New Zealand. So that's just one case. So you'd have to think, even if a fraction of that is achieved, it's a, it's a substantial opportunity, then you'll get challenged. So um, I could talk about a lot, a lot about opportunities. Um, equally, I could about challenges. One of, some of the big ones that we're thinking about at the moment is supply of skilled labour. I think we're going to hear a um, budget announcement Thursday afternoon. You know, we're eagerly waiting to see what that says, but we're not too optimistic at this stage about the, the supply of skilled labour. We've relied on it. We have to rely on it. New Zealand is a walled garden of talent. We're, we're recruiting trainees, graduates as quickly as we can, but there's a lead time on that. So this is a real headache for us and everybody in our industry. Um, if, those, if those growth uh, projections that I was talking about before are even half correct, um, we need this. Uh, resilience and security of supply. So I've talked a bit about the role that Amethyst has played in the past. Uh, the other part of that, from our perspective, is being ready for the big one. And so, you know, we've recently um, committed to a, a capital plan to kind of improve our resilience across our network. We've been uh, preparing for this and working on it quietly in the background, but uh, we see this as something to really work on. And then we're growth. So growth uh, may not necessarily mean the 13,500 ICP connections goes to 20,000 or 25. At the moment, certainly that number is, is gradually growing. Um, but certainly a, a change in the expectations around how we manage it. Um, you know, when we talk about solar on the West Coast, you know, people can know that's, that doesn't make sense. You know, we've got great um, water resource, but I'm not sure about sun. But you know, we've got something like 75 um, solar, solar connections, about half a percent. Are got solar connected. It doesn't sound like much, but it's the rate of change of that and the cost of the technology which we've got our eye on, and it's very cheap, and, and a lot of people will do it. Equally, electric cars are going to come and plug in, they're going to have an effect on our network, and we have to think about how we can manage that in the future. And then finally, White Heart. Um, you'll, many of you will be aware that we've been pursuing uh, White, the White Heart scheme uh, for a number of years. Um, it's a, for those who don't know, it's a 20 megawatts, the proposal is 20 megawatts run of river hydro schemes. It's very important to, to remind um, everybody that there is no requirement for a dam. This will have an effect on, a, on uh, 20 or 30 metres off the river, uh, not uh, damming any valleys or anything. So that's a big deal for us. It's something that often gets misunderstood. Substantial local benefits, employment, security of supply. Um, you know, we, we will. Uh, uh, we intend to, to spend somewhere around $100 million on this and uh, create something like 30 jobs for three years. So we see this as a, as a no-brainer. When we look at the, the driving policy uh, um, around decarbonisation, electrification, it's a no-brainer. Um, we're in a process at the moment and we uh, intend to continue. We have not given up on this project. But that's it from me. Well, we'll uh, open it up for questions. We'll this on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, obviously I'm quite keen to work with Peter and obviously the other Wi-Fi's members on, on resilience. And, uh, Peter's already aware of my aspirations in that space, but as part of the, I suppose, the wider community support for resilience, this battle plays a major part of that. Quite hard to me, it's critical, um, particularly in the South. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that lands, but yeah, there's quite a bit of work to do between now and Three years' time, we, we can actually have a solid foundation for the business on the coast. Thank you, Richard. Please. Um, so, please clarify if you have any last questions in the rack of this post. And um, a few institutions in the world. Um, uh, just look at you know, the street that they come to. In size of the town. So uh, we're really very fortunate to have, have um, West Power so far without um, too much government interference. 
um, of those tentacles seem to reach all sorts of places these days. Um, speaking of which, is the Waitaha, and um, I look forward to the, to the day when um, Waitaha is on the list of the, um, the assets because that's where it ought to be. Instead, we've got the government screaming at the moment trying to make a laser to try to make a case for this big hydro scheme down in Central, uh, which is all very well. I think they've got one that's, that's basically um, ready to go. That's the no brainer. And um, yeah, it does um, highlight a certain hypocrisy. But um, uh, I'm not in the um, 100% behind the White House. So I'll just put that out there. And um, as Peter says, um, it's far from dead. Councillor Martin. We've got tomorrow's headline. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, look forward to uh, hearing more and being involved. Um, health and safety innovation, briefly, what are you doing in that space? So the particular um, aspect of the power pilot innovation, we're creating a, an algorithm that detects a special case on a distribution network where the power line goes down and connects with the ground, but the, 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 the current base of protection does not trip. So in power systems, uh, protections, protection systems like a fuse in your house, for instance, are usually based on current measurement. Um, there's a case where it's very difficult to pick up this negligible current, but it's still extremely high voltage. So we've developed a way to do that. It's a world first. Um, and we're deploying it on the West Power Network and we're as part of our try to commercialise which technology we're also selling it to other customers. Joanne. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for the presentation, Peter. No, no questions from me, thank you. Sure. Thanks for the presentation. Um, great to see it, and lot especially aligned to the economic development of the future of the West Coast. So um, I'm sure there'll be a lot more discussions. Councillor Davis. Yeah, thanks, so, Peter. Just um, on the energy demand growth of 2019 to 2050, you mentioned um, solar power. Whereabouts else do you see the main source coming from? So, personally, I think that hydro is an excellent source of um, electricity generation, particularly for us here on the coast. Yeah. Um, the uh, Climate Change Commission's draft advice put uh, an interesting level of focus on um, wind and solar. Uh, equally, if, you, if we look at the longer and much technologies, at a big picture level, they, wind and solar, tend to be continuing to drop in price, or the cost of energy or cost. So um, those are the primary technologies, but as I've said, you know, in the context of West Power and Electricity Group, you know, we think Run of River Hydro is a, is a really important problem to play. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming along. Um, it's good to get an update. We had one some time back and uh, currently continues to grow. And uh, if global people knew, just how substantial it was. We'd be very surprised. We'd be very surprised. But we'd love to see you back. And uh, the door's always open. We certainly have our full support. So thanks so much. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. Right, would uh, someone, a council, like to move the presentation from Peter Armstrong, Chief Executive Officer from West Power, MC. Council Martin, I'm seeing the Council Davidson, those in favour? Aye. 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 On to the next item of the agenda, which is the Whistle Holdings on the Holding Board. Joanne, it's all yours. I know it's a Chris. Joanne, we've got, we've got Chris there with us, and maybe Chris can make the uh, PowerPoint work. So that would be <laughs> 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 Maybe. Maybe he's got a use. <laughs> um, and apologies for Chris Gawley. He's in the North Island somewhere and hasn't been able to get um, decent coverage. So. He can't be with us. So, hey, nice to know that the North Island has some of those cellular issues as well. He can't get through. 
Um, so look, this is a, just our report of um, from the the end to the end of March twenty uh, yeah thirty first of March twenty twenty one. So that's the end of the third quarter. Just really looking back um, on what we have achieved. So we'll start with the consolidated report. Um, so that's obviously where uh, we've had we've got income and expenses from both the subsidiary companies along with any. Um, income and expenditure for Western Holdings Limited. So it will include dividend, give, dividend receipts and uh, subvention payments. And the good news is that while the year to date still doesn't look as good as we hoped, um, the third quarter is actually looking better and we finally got that back into the black. So as previously reported, um, Westroads was having some issues and you'll see their, see their um, financial results shortly on the next slide. Um, but things have picked up a little bit and we're sort of starting to make a bit of headway. Um, so just, you know, you've got it there. Any, any questions on that particular slide? If just not, we'll move on to the next slide. Chris, you can cover that, please. Okay, so just we there. Um, yeah, we're down by $3 million on budget. They are getting slightly better than uh, where they were earlier on in the year. Um, we've written there that it's not ideal, but it's been bleeding for a little bit. Um, but that bleed has been stopped, I'd like to say. Uh, the fourth, fourth quarter is looking uh, quite a bit stronger. Um, we've got that project that we know about on the old West Coast Road, and they have got some uh, good projects going forward. Work in Christchurch, um, so we're still working on some of the uh, lower margin work. But they do have um, about $4 million worth of better margin work coming up. Um, so, hopefully, we'll see that in the results later on. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that whilst they are doing really well and getting us back towards the black, um, by the end of the year, um, we'll just be happy to see them at that zero line or um, slightly, slightly rough. Yeah. Questions around this stuff then? Yeah. yeah. Just what was it? What's the cause of the uh, budget uh, down three mil? So that earlier on in the year they had quite a bit of heavy um, view or dollar uh, asset stuff sitting around while they're waiting for some contracts to come up. So those contracts have come up now, but it's fine. Thank you. Uh, so we're moving on to Destination Westland and um, the good news is that Destination Westland is looking pretty good. Um, I have just realised that the, the, the numbers provided in the bottom left hand corner are to the end of February um, instead of the end of March. So apologies for that, but the, the trend has continued. Um, Destinations Westland has had gross revenue, which is up on budget, but also the profit year to date, uh, as at the end of February, unfortunately. Um, the profit year to date was 165,000 against a budget of a 30,000 loss. So, um, so things are looking pretty good in, in Destination Westland, given where we were this time last year. You recall the forecasts were looking pretty, pretty grim. Um, part of the success of that is around wild foods. Um, a fantastic event this year, 9,000 in attendance and a profit of 50,000. So um, hope, long may that continue. Um, the airport revenues are starting to pick up a wee bit. The helipad's still struggling, but it had the best month uh, in April since, since COVID. So, you know, hopefully that will continue to grow over the coming months. Um, and Destination Westland is obviously involved with the South Island Ultramarathon, which was, um, you know, a fantastic opportunity and good to see another good event um, being supported by Destination Westland. So any questions here? Just to comment, um, and I can put my hotel ahead on there, um, but just, just good to see uh, something going on in the winter period like that South Island. May is typically a very low month. Um, and so good to see something in town that's bringing people in in the winter period. Yeah. So a lot of people here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Good. Awesome. 
Um, yeah, so, um, so look, this is a, a more a looking back report rather than looking forward. Um, but, you know, we're, Western Holdings is making sure that the subsidiaries have their, just their strategic plans in place and are looking forward in a positive way. And at the end of June, you'll have the final SOI um, to approve along with um, the report on the governance for destination wisdom going forward and also for, so Chris and Chris and I, um, our appointments are all up at the end of June and we're looking um, to seek reappointment onto the Western Holdings Board for another three years. So um, yeah, things are looking pretty good just at the moment. Questions there, Councillors? Let's be it's not the first time we've sat around the table to do the six monthly reports. Our um, very low. Seems to, it, it's something that happens. Mm. And we, what we rely on is we produce a result at the 30th of June, which they always do. This year may be slightly more difficult, but uh, it has been an unusual year. Um, so any, any, any other questions before we close this one that was easy, Jane. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Chris, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Pretty easy, but good plucking. 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 Good on to the next item, which is the staff reports. And uh, Tiara is going to talk about uh, the district economic stimulus fund report. It's on page seven to 11 of your agenda. Uh, good afternoon, Your Worship, Council of the Members. I'll take the report as read, but in brief summary, there was a grant made available to this council and other councils in the East Coast in October 2015. And with applications due to be submitted and considered by June 2016. Development West Coast now having done a wash up in terms of funds that were available and applied for, and determined that there was 20,000 still available for people in West Coast to apply for. So the decision of the council is whether we wish to call for applications for the remainder of that fund or not take the opportunity. Uh, I'm still so, um, incentive for a lot of community groups. Right, um, the, I, I think I can make a difference in some the, um, the Great District Council um, has a contestable fund, which is um, an interesting concept, but maybe with a bit. I think we need to put it out for um, uh, community groups, businesses to apply for. Absolutely. It would be mad to send it back. But let's keep it a nice, short process and get the money um, realised. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Might as well open it up for community projects. Sure. Um, I think what I can say is because that it's only 20,000. Don't want to chew up too much admin mm. on it. I wonder if when it goes out, it's kind of targeted to actually limit the applications rather than have to deal with a whole lot of what could be a whole lot of admin for 20,000 to make the selection. It is a business economic stimulus package. I mm. doubt there will be no more community. It's my understanding. Mm. Yeah, there's a clear policy that aligns with the applications have to be in line with. Um, Joey, anything on this one? Oh, look, I just agree with Peter. Um, it would be good if if the funding was for one or sort of at most two applications rather than any smaller ones. Um, a for admin and B just because it's the, the impact is so much better than. I'm going to pass on this one. And um, <laughs> yep. okay, so I'd like to move that um, A the committee received the report. B, that Westland District Council reopen the, the District Economic Stimulus Fund to the Westland District and receive applications for the unused funding of 20,000. 
funding is open for a period of 32 days. C, that council consider applications to meet the purpose and criteria of the fund, and then submit the preferred applicants to develop this coast. We'll move then. Councillor Martin, thank you. Councillor Hart, those in favour? Aye. Thank you. We move on to uh, the item in relation. Thanks, uh, TC. Move on to Mary. And uh, Nathan, do you want to come front and do you want me to come up the front? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I've never stood there before. It's time, it's time to stand behind the legs. No, it's just that uh, if you're up here on the live stream, I won't be able to see you and hear what you're saying. I'll leave it the same. That might be a piece of something. <laughs> Good everyone and members of the public that are joining. Um, the Western Tuanga Masariki Festival is a concept that was um, has um, its roots firmly grounded with Otani Naitahu as um, as part of uh, of um, this Takiwa. And what that means is we are wanting to ensure that anything we do is culturally correct. And um, as Guardians, Kaitiaki of this area, the knowledge held by McCarfield and um, Katiwaiwai is the correct knowledge and it's knowledge that we want to give effect to. So, what that means is we've taken what was a winter festival concept from Lions from years past and actually thought about how we can better align that for this event and uh, actually lift the profile of the event to be something that we hope will attract um, inter-regional visitation. Just had to include those words. Um, so the concept is eight weeks of events small and big to celebrate and acknowledge on uh, Matariki and Lisa for the months of June and July. And for those who have lived on the West Coast for more than one uh, Matariki will know that those are quiet months generally for visitation, um, generally quite dark months because they are winter months. And this event um, is tribute to that by hopefully increasing visitation and also acknowledging the fact that it's dark and playing on that through a festival of light. So the concept is to have a legacy event and the legacy event being the Huanga um, Matariki Festival of Light the concept is to light Pukatika, light the CBD, light the businesses, light publicly owned infrastructure where possible, where that lighting already exists, and also to engage professional lighting companies to tell stories on our buildings. Um, an example of when this happened was in 2018 when the Carnegie building was lit, um, acknowledging um, World War I and some stories around that, which was a fantastic event. So discussions are underway at the moment with professional lighting companies to look at um, significant buildings throughout the CBD and the surrounding area around Pukatika to light them in a way that engages people through interactive storytelling. Um, obviously that um, will come at a cost and we have put forward an application to the Regional Events Fund that DWC manages, um, which we will be uh, a few weeks, probably eight weeks away from hearing a decision on. Um, expanding out from that concept, we also intend to hold um, events in the evening that work in partnership with uh, community groups and business. Those include um, evening markets, night market and a food market to be held or proposed to be held in Rebel Street during the school holidays. Um, we also partnering with Western District Council uh, to organise a exhibition uh, at Paki Waitara for, uh, for the weeks around the school holidays where Tāponga or student work will be um, displayed around the theme, what does Puanga Matariki mean to you? And those entries for that exhibition are 
are very wide and can range from sculpture, digital design, written. There is no limitation on the entries um, submitted, so that will be open at Pati Waitara and manned by volunteers. Also, as part of that exhibition, it's proposed to have six cultural workshops ranging from um, weaving, um, uh, I'm just looking at the notes, boy making, um, storytelling, so quite an engaging experience. And that's, um, I think, why Councillor Cogan is late this evening, as she's actually down in southwestern promoting the festival. So she's visiting all of the schools in the district to ensure that the festival is firmly a western festival. And just take this opportunity to move to an aside and talk about the vision for the future. This year is about piloting and trialling and starting small within um, Hukitika. The intent in the future is to grow this to be truly a Western festival. Working with Western High School in, um, in July, there will be a dancing with the stars, the Kani Kani Mina Fitu uh, event um, at Western High School, which is effectively uh, a dance community celebration that um, we're working with uh, community groups um, to have community concert for things like Come Dressed as Your Favourite Movie Star, Rock Star, Sports Star, Zodiac Star, Constellation Star. So you can see how we're taking this thing and applying it in a wide way. Um, the library's on board and holding um, family evenings at the library where there'll be wire crafts traditional stories, Kai, um, and a really fun family atmosphere, working in partnership with already existing events like the Lantern Parade that is very successfully run each year, um, and advertising that as part of this festival. There's a craft market proposed and organised to happen at Seaview, Midwinter Christmas. Um, additional to this, we are working with Wukitika's Region Theatre to organise a launch event on the 2nd of July. Um, we will hopefully have some guest speakers and display um, kapahaka performances from the local kapahaka groups, as well as a midwinter variety concert, similar to the concert that's held prior to the turning on of the Christmas lights. Um, we intend for that to be held the week of the 5th of July at the Region Theatre. Um, as well as this, there's a number of community initiatives that are run and in the past by Lions that serve social um, outcomes, such as Midwinter Christmas Wish, where we, um, through, with sponsorship and support from the Hukitika Guardian, collect um, nominations from the community for residents aged 65 and over and deliver them a, effectively a care package in winter. Um, acknowledging the important part that retired members of our community play to our ongoing success and vitality. Um, there's other events as well as the Christmas um, Tree Festival that's held over a period of weeks at a location to be determined. As well as all of these events, we have also put a request out through Council's um, formal channels as well as the Facebook page, um, Western Puanga Masariki Festival, seeking from any other community groups or businesses um, events that are happening during June and July that would then be able to be um, incorporated as part of this event and advertised under the umbrella of Wonga Matariki. I have done a lot of talking, so I'll now open it up for uh, any questions or comments before I say what I'd like from Council. Council left. Um, yeah, thanks. It's up. Uh, as you know, I don't say no to any idea. Um, you know, I think the piloting and the controlling is uh, is uh, really good. Um, it would be really good to have uh, some idea of the, of the cost. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can talk to that briefly. There's a budget being developed. The budget, um, the budget has tiers. So effectively, the whole concept is that whatever um, is to be run, needed to be run for nothing, i.e. lines, club, fundraise and paper. So that's tier one. 
and then to take that from being a small or smallish community event to grow it into what we hope to be a have an event within it that would attract um, inter-regional visitation it needs another tier of funding. So, um, so if that tier of funding is successful, um, and that to light the buildings and stuff, we're talking about needing, we're needing external funding of about 60,000 to achieve that. So the event will proceed, and it will proceed with the support of the funders that already exist. But what's necessary to take it to the level that it's intended to take to and pile up is around sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, which has been a bite. Yep. So, so initially there'll be no no tears from your right back. No, no. Hopefully no, <laughs> hopefully no metaphorical <laughs> physical tears. No, no one should be crying, crying over this. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying it. And now I'm gonna pass on this one again. Okay. Okay. Any views? Um, look, great, great idea, um, Latham and, and your team you're working with. Um, a couple of things really is uh, how's it going to be promoted and, you know, especially if you're looking for people to come from outside the region, you know, where are you, where are you where advertising or how you're advertising the events that are going on? And, and the second one was um, what a fantastic opportunity for West Park to promote themselves um, with a light show of some sort. Thanks, Joe. Um, so the first thing is around marketing. So um, about three months ago, we approached Destination Western with the opportunity to partner with uh, this event, to which we were told maybe. And um, we then followed that up with another um, request to partner, and we were told we would be we would get a reply. So we were waiting. Um, some some reply which we would assume that there is and the and the reason the endeavour to partner was around existing events set up. So Destination Western is responsible for the biggest event on the coast and has a track record of running that well. And there must be um, there must be capacity capability in terms of things like marketing and promotions to work together. So on marketing those existing channels we'd really like to work with yep. and, and again put the, put the um, branch out to partner with Destination Western to uh, achieve that and yeah really good idea about um, Transpower, West Power, sorry, West Power. Yeah. Um, We've just before we meet. <laughs> well that, that's really where my question was going to be directed. What was, what was the main event that you were feeling was going to actually bring people? Because this, this is a bit of a mishmash of some events that we already hold and just pulling it under an umbrella to market it, um, plus a few others added in. But what's the what's the big thing you think is actually going to pull people from other regions to come see? Is it this the light up thing of just coming in? So the visitation stats for the West Coast and for take for nightly stay is about 1.6. Night. So, if you need people to stay longer, we need a um, we need something that that in winter. The, the concept is we need people to visit this town and want to be here in the evening and have things to do in the evening. And the vision would be the whole town lit, every business lit, the council infrastructure and assets assets lit really well. That it becomes an attraction in itself. Similar to festivals of light held in, in other, you know, in cities and other townships around the country where people um, go specifically for the purpose of visiting that. Visiting that. And in a way, we are almost borrowing reefed in the Town of Light's um, slogan, but um, acknowledging it in a different way. Imagine the whole town um, lit properly um, as a visitor attraction with in that having um, firmly grounded in that um, authentic and traditional storytelling happening as well. That's engaging and on buildings like light shows and displays, water fans that cast light. All of this is conceptual because it actually has to be um, funded and delivered on. And the other thing is there seems to be a timing thing. You, you kind of said you've applied for the funding you might hear in about eight weeks or so and I'm going it's May so that's July and this is a June July thing. Do you want we've, to been, we've been talking to the partners, the companies that we've been talking to 
we were really concerned about it as well. And they turned around um, some stuff pretty quick um, recently. And they were telling us about some stories where they had 24 hours to produce something in a different township. We don't want to be in that stress mode, but we want to do this properly. And it may be that we do that prop we do that stage of it uh, next year. We're not wanting to make a hash. Light, it didn't, didn't go to light, like must be fantastic. Uh, Anna. Um, no, thanks, Latham. Um, a great deal of work's gone in behind it, and yeah, I'd just like to see it all come to what we wish it to be. It'd be great. Yeah, thank you. The um, ideas like this um, always need someone to champion them drive them forward and um, that's been based on this. Um, so totally no time there. And, um, go through no uh, fully supported of it. But um, uh, it's Latham's idea. Uh, and, and he has single-handedly has, has um, pushed it along and now has a, has a committee behind him. So, um, so firstly, um, up to Council Martin for getting it going. Because I, I think that this is actually something that can, in the future, will be the mainstay of the winter calendar on this coast. And, um, so, so we shouldn't underestimate it. Bear in mind, of course, that from next year, it's a national holiday, I think. Um, and bringing the schools on board is the key to this. Um, because the, um, this whole, this whole um, Matariki industry really um, has only really began in the last decade, even less than that. Uh, it's got legs, um, and it's uh, it's not something that was uh, really celebrated. Um, I was trying to vote, and um, hence it is a poem. Matariki, and poem, of course, is the, is the start of it. Um, Seeds, Matariki, and Matariki is not easy to see on the West Coast because of the mountains. But the um, poem it is, of course, and everyone will recognize the poem when you see it and you call it out that that's the start. It's like, ah, oh, that one. Because um, people look at it like the morning star and, and um, uh, so it will have more poems when it's pointed out to people. So, uh, anyway, the um, Having the, the range of, um, of activities spread over, over uh, weeks is a good idea. And um, yeah, I do think that it will, um, um, I do think it will make a big difference to, um, to winter's people. You know, people don't like what happening, people don't like to leave the home, um, but uh, this gives a Good reason to get out there and, and, and it's nothing more than just to show the community spirit. Um, but it's also been part of what's going to be a national program of last week of celebrations and festivities. Um, and so, um, the rest of us want to miss out on that. So, to, to front foot it and put back to as, as the town of flight is. Um, um, great idea and um, deserve some support from um, all sports at DWC. So, um, yeah, that's the best questions. Leave it from the front. You've done a great job playing with this one. Um, I'd, I'd like to see every business in Hokitika finally get down to putting their lights up. And, um, and there's no doubt about the Light attracts people. You know, it's like in, in June, July, you go know, to the main street at five o'clock, which is pretty, pretty hard, isn't it? And if you can come into the place and it's light, you go, wow. And I'm, I'm very excited to say, really appreciate what you've done. Anything we can do. That's what I want to talk about. It comes in. Excellent. That comes in very, very briefly. <laughs> yeah, most of this is operational, but it needs to be nice. <clears throat> The request is not for a bag of money, food here. It's for what we already have to work well. We have lights that exist. We have assets that exist that need to be working. The trees through the CBD need to be going. We've got a lot of infrastructure across the streets and across walkways that needs to be um, 
is made safe and functional. And we need a team within council or a key contact person within council to ensure that that can happen. And some of that may require money if there's going to be safety concerns raised around um, connecting uh, lights, et cetera, into networks, particularly networks that aren't out. So we need to cut through a lot of that noise and actually achieve an outcome of, um, of getting what we've already got working. And that would be a fantastic start because we have a lot of um, we have a lot of lights. We have community fundraise for a lot, and council supported the community by purchasing and installing a lot. So I, I really put that plea to council is can we oh, to council, sorry, can we please make sure that what we've got is working come the end of this month? So first of June, the tree lights are going. The string lights are going, the icicle lights are going, the town entrance lights are going, uh, the transportation lights that are going. Great. Happy with that, Simon. There is a question around who owns what. So some of this, particularly the tree lights, aren't actually council assets. So we need to work through who's responsible for what before we can commit to anything. So I'll work with my staff and actually understand exactly how they were incorporated and how we actually go forward to make them work. And once again, this is stuff we don't actually have a budget for. Um, we do have a budget. Comes live once the other two peers are approved and accepted. Um, the other council will bring that money forward unbudgeted. But um, in terms of the other uh, functional lights, definitely um, the ones I could take a sign that they should be working by tomorrow night, I think. Um, and the other ones that are in the review. The heritage uh, lights have been ordered, but they won't be ready by the time. So. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. Someone like a move for the presentation from uh, Gus and Marjorie. Thanks, Tina. See you Peter, those in favour. Now move into the Warren Waiting present time. And um, he someone like to resolve the economic. Development committee meeting for the to uh, public exclusion. Skinny, Anna, those in favour?